Ladies and gentlemen, uh, would you all please stand for His Excellency, the Honourable Alex Chernoff, the Governor of Victoria, and Mrs Elizabeth Chernoff. Please be seated. My name is James Angus and I'm the Dean of the Faculty of Medicine, Dentistry and Health Sciences here at the University of Melbourne. On behalf of the University, it is a very great pleasure to welcome you tonight to Derek Denton Lecture in Science and the Arts. I'd particularly like to acknowledge the presence here tonight of the following people. His Excellency, the Honourable Alex Chernoff, Governor of Victoria, and Mrs. Elizabeth Chernoff, the Right Honourable Malcolm Fraser, Mr. Bailey Meyer and Mrs. Sarah Meyer, Mr. Martin Meyer and Mrs. Louise Meyer, Professor Emeritus Derek Denton and Dame Margaret Scott, Professor Emeritus Augustus, Augustus Nossel, Professor Emeritus David Pennington, Professor Suzanne Corey, and the Honourable Dr. Barry Jones. The University of Melbourne acknowledges the traditional owners of the lands on which our campuses are situated. We pay our respects to their elders, past and present, and extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Australians who have made a contribution to the life of the university community. It is now my great pleasure to introduce His Excellency, the Honourable Alex Chernoff, Governor of Victoria, who will introduce our orator. Thank you, Dean, uh, and I also acknowledge the distinguished guests whom uh, the Dean uh, uh, named, and I hope you forgive me for not naming each and every one of you, but that will uh, add to the brevity of the occasion if I don't do that. Uh, like you, Dean, I uh, join you in acknowledging the traditional owners of the land, the Kulin Nations, and pay my respects to their elders past and present. Uh, <clears throat> it's appropriate at this stage to acknowledge the man who was the personification of this series of lectures, Professor Derek Denton. He is, particularly in the world of science, a living legend. The university and others here and around the world regard him as one of the greatest achievers in medical science in the late 20th century. Derek Denton is renowned for his groundbreaking research work in basic biology, including vital work on the body's use of salt. Much of that work was reported in his classic book, The Hunger for Salt, which was described by Harvard University's <coughs> Dr. John Pappenheimer as the best example of intricative ph physiology to come out of the second half of the 20th century. That quotation gives you a small taste of how highly regarded is the work of Professor Denton. He's also the founding director, or was the founding director, of the world-renowned Howard Floor Institute. And his legacy in that regard lives on through the vital work now carried on by that institute. In the international work of, uh, world of science, Professor Denton's scientific and medical work have been recognised by a way of many prestigious awards and appointments to leading uh, world Institutes. This includes in his early election in 1974 as a foreign medical member of the Royal Swedish Academy of Sciences. Amongst its other duties, the Academy nominates three of the winners of Nobel Prize each year. The contribution of Derek Denton to our community is not limited to work and scholarship in science. With his wife, Dame Margaret Scott, <coughs> Professor Denton has been an outstanding contributor to the arts in Australia over many years, something which was recognised in the Australia Day 2005 honours when he was made a Companion of the Order of Australia and the citation for that award recites 
his outstanding leadership in medical research and the arts. And with great generosity, Professor Denton has endowed the university with funds for a continuing biennial lecture series which will bring speakers of truly global stature in science and the arts to the university and present lectures in their specialties. Importantly, Professor Denton hopes that the eminent lecturers will not only address the university community as in tonight's lecture, but also have time to engage with academics in their fields at the university. I now turn to our guest lecturer this evening, Professor Erling Norby from the Kingdom of Sweden, where amongst other public <laughs> officers, he holds the office of Lord Chamberlain in waiting in the court of King Carl Gustav XVI. He currently is serving as vice chairman of the J. Craig Ventner Institute, which has a large research and development presence in Maryland and California in the United States. There he continues to be at the forefront of the advancement of contemporary molecular biology and provides leadership in the Institute's quest to contribute to the eradication of infectious diseases around the world. Professor Norby is one of the world's outstanding virologists and immunologists and is recognised as a leader in those fields. And if one has to highlight only one area of scientific and medical work for which, he's, for which the world will be forever grateful to him, it is in the area of dealing with the eradication of measles. We take it for granted today that this disease is no longer life-threatening in our country, or in the world for that matter. But only a little over a decade ago, the world saw over 45 million cases of malaria being diagnosed, from which over 800,000 people died, many in the developed world. During the past three decades or so, he produced over 400 high-level papers about 70% of which dealt with the virus aspects of me measles and its eradication. Professor Norby was instrumental in identifying the core, core virus and the basis for developing vaccines against that disease. And as a result of Professor Norby's work and those with whom he worked, by the end of the last decade, the number of deaths for measles in the world has been reduced to 165,000 with 77% or thereabouts being in Southeast Asia. It is a small wonder that in science and in the medical world, he's affectionately known as Mr. Measles. So tonight we have Mr. Measles and Mr. Salt. Uh, <clears throat> I should say that he's, of course, an expert in other infectious diseases, including HIV. <clears throat> as a major contributor to global research in, this, in his field, Professor Norby served for 25 years as professor and chairman at the Karolinska Institute, Sweden's leading scientific centre. Through its Nobel Committee uh, <coughs> for uh, Physiology and Medicine, the Institute is the leading contributor to the nomination of Nobel Prize laureates in these disciplines. And from 1997 to 2003, Professor Norby was permanent secretary of the Swedish Royal Swedish Academy of Sciences, where he expanded his continuing contribution to the Nobel Committee, this time contributing to the selection of laureates in the fields of physics and chemistry. During his near 20 years of involvement with the Nobel Prize, including a period spent as a member of the board of the Nobel Foundation, Professor Norby has had a unique insight into the working and the selection of various Nobel Prizes including those of life sciences. The world is grateful to you, Professor Norby, uh, Professor Norby, for opening the otherwise mysterious world surrounding the Nobel Prize in your fabulous book, Nobel Prize and Life Sciences. We're grateful to Professor Denton for seducing you to come to Melbourne to deliver this lecture. Uh, I know that you were to go, due to go from here to Taiwan, where you'll wear another one of your many hats, this time representing Sweden at the International Human Rights Network 
of the acad academies and scholarly societies meeting. As governor and former chancellor of this university, I can say that, that uh, it is a coup for the University of Melbourne and for Victoria to have you, Professor Norby, presenting what I'm sure will be a fascinating and insightful lecture this evening. I apologise in advance, Professor Norby, for leaving immediately after your uh, lecture to attend another long-standing commitment. But ladies and gentlemen, Professor Erling Norby. So, Your Excellency and uh, Your Honourable Alex Chano and uh, Mrs. Elizabeth Chano, I would thank you very much for that very generous introduction. It's a great joy to be here in, in Melbourne and to address you today. But I would also like to uh, particularly address myself to the Dean of the Medicine, James Angus, <coughs> also managing this ceremony, and foremost, perhaps, also to uh, the tribute, which is to Professor Derek. Denton, as you heard, a long-standing friend of Sweden, and uh, he developed contacts way back uh, with uh, researchers in the field of physiology, in particular Professor Bengt Andersson, who became the professor of physiology at the Karolinska Institute in the way back in the late 1960s, uh, successor to uh, Ulf von Euler, one of the Nobel laureates from the Karolinska Institute. And as part of those contacts, uh, you were uh, selected as a foreign member of our academy, where you have been a very active foreign member. And through that, you've also been selected, for example, to be a member of an OECD examinating committee that came to Sweden to give advice on how we should manage our uh, research. And as also mentioned, although that, of course, is something that needs to be secret, you have been active nominated for Nobel Prizes. And I might, well, reveal the secret that, that yes, if it hadn't been for your nomination, I think Sperry would not have gotten his prize for the split brain. But you can keep that to yourself. <laughs> so, uh, finally, I've enjoyed through the last years the fact that in your impressive each year little circumnavigation of the world, you make a stop, stop over in Stockholm, give some time to, to talk about many different things, often together with Torsten Wiesel, who is a good friend of yours. And I just wish that for many years to come, you will continue this traveling around the world so that we can meet and talk about life and the pleasures of life. Because we are privileged people, those of us who enjoy the science, and I'm going to talk to you today about uh, Nobel Prize in Nature Secrets, which, of course, is a very wide title and uh, allows me to really include almost whatever I, I, I like. But Nobel Prizes have a unique prestige as prizes. And uh, they, you can ask, why is that? Well, first of all, they have been awarded for more than 100 years. And uh, when the first prize was were eventually given in 1901, of course, the, it was a particular prize. It was a large sum of money, but that turns out not to be the key thing. But it was international. And that was rare in those days of national chauvinism. And, uh, but Nobel himself, who wrote the, the will that that really led to these prizes. He uh, only lived in Sweden for relatively short times. He was an international businessman. So he knew what, what it meant to transgress borders, both in, in, in life and in, in science. Now, the task to select prize recipients was taken very seriously by those bodies that were selected to, to, uh, to, to select them. Uh, these included in the Royal Sweet Academy of Sciences, which is responsible for the prize in physics and in chemistry, and the Karolinska Institute, the School of Medicine in Stockholm, that is responsible for the prize in physiology or medicine, a very clever formulation. And overall, if you read the will of Alfred Nobel, that really 
uh, is the, the origin of these prizes. It, it's a very interesting document. It's written in Swedish. It's handwritten. He didn't have any legal assistance. Just took it out of his brain. And a few very, very clever aspects of, of the will, and that is that he, he said that it should be, if we not talk about the three prizes in science, it should be a matter of a discovery. And in physics, it can be a discovery or an invention. In chemistry, a discovery or an improvement. But in physiology, it may be only discovery. So you need to define very carefully what is a discovery. And that's been very helpful in our, in our endeavors to really aim at these events in science that completely change the course of science. That is a true discovery. <coughs> uh, originally, I should say also that, that Nobel had the idea of finding that 35-year-old who had made a major discovery, giving all this money, which should be 20 years' salary. This was a, a scholarship, really. And he thought also that one could very quickly see when something important had happened in science, so it should be given to someone who the previous year had made this discovery. You know. And in the end, also, he was an idealist, so it should be to the benefit of mankind. Uh, not all these dimensions could be readily fulfilled, but the, the committees that were set up to do this work took it very seriously. From the very first year, one secured that one had some very good nominations, very good candidates, and one made very thorough reviews of these candidates, trying to use what you might call Scandinavian objectivity and try to select the best candidate. And that has been really, the, the goals have been very set at that, that is very, on this demanding level, and because of that, I would argue that more than 90% of those people that we have been selecting for the prizes have stood the test of time. And that is the reason why the Nobel Prize has become so famous. There's no other prize in the world that comes close to it when it comes to measure excellence in science. It's this historical fact. Let me now describe a little things that that I myself have been come engaged in. And so, as was mentioned, I've been very privileged of working with the Nobel Prize in Physiology and Medicine for more than 20 years. So I became a professor in virology at the, uh, in, at the Karolinska Institute in 1972, and the next year, in 73, I was on that committee. Now, in formal terms, uh, so the committee is just the five people, but medicine is such a big field that you need to uh, really have a representation from, from many different disciplines. So in practice, what, what way we have done it for many, many years is to have a committee of five people, but to adjunct 10 people each year to assist in this. So we work with 15 people, and that's the reason why I've been both an ordinary member or an adjunct member for, the, for the more than, or close to the, to the 20 years and so forth. Among all the things at the Karolinska Institute, I think this interaction with the colleagues was the best, actually. We were talking about, I've been running the Karolinska Institute as a dean, and that is not an, an, an easy task. But for once, in the Nobel work, one forgot about the territorial protection and so forth, because you talked science. You tried to persuade your colleagues that the, the, the candidate you had was the most important candidate and uh, uh, that, uh, that the reason why you, they should support you in this. So you learned a lot. And, and, and uh, someone has said that, that, uh, that the, the Nobel Prize is maybe more important to Sweden than to the international community. I mean, it forces the scientists in our country to keep abreast with developments and so on. So a little about, about, about the formalities. Now, what about using the material that had been accumulated over the years by the Nobel committees? So then there is a 50 years rule. Why 50 years? Well, probably the idea being that as you uh, review the archives, the person that had been, or person that had been discussed should not be alive any longer. So 50 years is a long time, and you have to go back for quite, quite a while then. Uh, so this January, I was looking then at the documents from the, the 
Prize in, in 1961. So. But, so I did, started to do this a few years ago and realized that the, 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 the uniqueness of this material and uh, that built up a number of essays that actually published in a regular scientific journal. So there is still some interesting for, for history. Uh, and in the end, I could uh, bring this together into, an, into a book that's called the Nobel Prize in Life Sciences. And it stretches all the way until prices in 1959. And it's mostly about my own field in virology. And I will come back to, to one of the fields here in, in a moment. Uh, but what, what is the archive material? And uh, you can see this in the back, but you need to see it. I just wanted to show the, the Nobel year. Nobel year starts more than a year before we finally give the prize. And that is, uh, we send out invitations to nominate to the prizes. Because only people that are invited to nominate have the right to, to do that. And uh, that is sent out way the year before. And then the critical date is January 31st, the year when the prize is going to be given. And that's the latest day for submitting a nomination. This, the nominations have evolved over time. And uh, I just was at the meeting at the academy where the physicists, for the first time, had, had, had another record. And they had 560 nominations for Nobel Prize in Physics. So you ask yourself, how do you sort that out? Well, it's a highly lubricated machinery. And of course, these are not all new nominations. They are only about some, some uh, some 10, 15 percent are the new nominations. So it's an ongoing process with the reviews of that. But what other materials are there? Well, the committees work here and they select particular candidates for reviewing. This could be a shorter review, it could be longer reviews, could be reviews of fields of science. And uh, altogether, this builds, together with the nominations, a very interesting material. There are no discussion protocols. So you cannot see how the arguments were for and against the different candidates. You only see the conclusion of that. Something you can read out that, yes, the committee could not come to an, an agreement. Although in my time, we mostly try to, to bring it so that we have a unanimous committee. But, but that hasn't always been, been the case. Uh, so someone who wants to look into this uh, can then use this material, but it's only after permission, and it's, it's for scholarly use. So it's not for a journalist who's curious about what happened and so forth. It is really to be used for the, for the history of science purposes. So a little about the background material. Let me now move into, the, into the, 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 some of the things I would like to share with you. First, a picture of Sven Gard, who was my predecessor as professor of virology at the Karolinska Institute. He became a professor there in 1948. Uh, he has been a really dominating personality in, in the field, called the father of virology in, in Sweden. And he was the one who tempted me, as a medical student during the third year of my studies, uh, to shift and not becoming a clinician, but becoming a scientist. The mentor is very, very important. The reason I show his, his, uh, regard is also that he was very influential in Nobel work and throughout from 1948 and onwards until he retired in 1971. He was very active in the committee. He spoke uh, on five occasions to the Nobel uh, Prize recipients. He was, Sven uh, Gard was interested in polio. And where, where did that interest come from? Well, it came from, from this man whose name is Carl Kling, and he was one generation older than, than Gard. He had an idea that was very heretic at the time. He said, I think that polio is spreading by water. And he was even thinking about that could be some intermediate host for the virus. I mean, this was all speculative. And this was heresy because at that time, the whole idea was that polio virus can only grow in nerve cells. Because Simon Flexner, who was directing the Rockefeller, uh, university or uh, the Rockefeller Institute at that time, he, uh, he had said that that was so and I'm proving it experimentally. Uh, it so happened that this is Albert Seyman, a young Albert Seyman standing on his right side and John Paul has written the best book about polio. It's on his right side and this is from a conference in Sweden in the early 1950s that actually on in the microbiology. 
So a waterborne disease, how could that be? Well, this uh, brings me to McFarlane Burnett that had been one of my major engagements during the, the, the last year. Because, of course, if you have started to write about Nobel Prizes, you can carry on because there is new materials coming out every year. And the prize in 1960, as you'll see in a moment, was to McFarlane Burnett and uh, um, Peter Meraware. But I wanted to highlight two things on this, what you, oh, sorry about that, uh, to illustrate this young McFarlane Burnett with a monkey here. So this is way back in the 19, <coughs> late 19. 20s, and uh, polio, a major polio epidemic had been hit, had been spreading here in, in Montreal, and uh, at that time I was using antibodies, passive immunization to protect against polio, and of course, McFarlane Burnett did the obvious thing. He carefully checked whether the antibodies that were generated could, could, could protect about this virus, and also reference strain of virus, but it didn't block or didn't neutralize the reference strain of virus. So his conclusion was there must be more than one type of polio. It's a very important and simple discovery. And eventually, of course, it had been documented that there are three types of polio virus. And this is absolutely essential to know if you're going to produce a vaccine that affects it. And Yolba Sanyogox explain why sometimes people could have two consequence, uh, consequential bouts of, of polio. But he did something more, and that's the reason why I brought it up. And there was another epidemic in Melbourne here in the end of the 1930s. And uh, the monkeys that were used were normally uh, <coughs> resource monkeys from, uh, gone from India, and they were rather difficult to, to infect. Uh, so one had to barely distill it into the, the nose of, of the animals. But for some reason, he couldn't get hold of that monster. Instead, he got some Cynomolgus monkeys from a more close by setting and found out that they were more infectious than the rhesus monkey. They could be infected straight into the, the, into the, the throat. And then Burnett did one of the simple experiments uh, that I think reflects his, his really genius. So he simply took two monkeys, and instead of exposing the, the upper respiratory tract and so forth, he injected the virus directly into the intestine. And what happened? The animals got polio. So that showed that, yes, polio is transmitted as an enteric infection, that, it, that it, the virus goes to the intestine, and that's why the infection starts. And that was a completely new perspective on polio. But uh, Burnett did so many different things so that these particular discoveries were never highlighted in particular. Anyhow, in the, in the early part of, the, of the, <coughs> the 20th century, polio was the number one scare when it came to diseases. And the contribution by these three men was absolutely similar in changing that. It was an example of a very serendipitous finding. What had happened? Well, uh, the, the three people are Thomas Weller, Frederick Robbins, and John Enders. And they're working in the John Enders laboratory. And John Enders, uh, he was interested in trying to make viruses causing disease in man growing in cell cultures, because that was a way of studying the viruses. And uh, then it happened that Thomas Weller, he had uh, received material from an, a legally aborted human fetus. He had some cell cultures. He wanted to see if varicella virus could grow in this. So he put varicella virus on that they had some leftover cultures. And for some reason, and there the history is not very clear, one took some polio material from the freezers and put that on the cells. And of course, the varicella virus didn't grow, but polio virus grow directly. And this shouldn't be, because uh, Simon Flexner said they can only grow in nerve cells. It wasn't true. It could grow in any kind of cell, in fibroblasts, endothelial cells, and so forth. And this open up a completely new field because if you could grow polyvirus in, in this kind of cell, you could also produce a vaccine. And very rapidly one initiated program to uh, develop a vaccine. Now, uh, a guard, of course, introduced this laureate at, at the prize ceremony, and he highlighted it was not only that they had managed to grow polyvirus in cells, 
it had a more general importance, namely that there were now techniques to identify many different viruses by the new kind of, of procedure, and that was by using TRIPS, and you can get a monolayer culture of cells. You could now study viruses in a way that you could never do before, and that's why why God says that by giving the virologists a practical method for the isolation and study of viruses, you relieve them of a handicap, burdening them since from the birth of their science and place them for the first time on even footing with other microbe hunters. The golden era of virology had been opened up, as uh, highlighted by Burnett. But Burnett also was a kind of end of science person. He said, oh, so during the 50s, we isolated all these medically important viruses which was great, but coming to the end of that uh, decade, many of the important viruses have been isolated. So according to Burnett, that, uh, that was the time to shift to another field that will come to in, in a moment. And of course, that was when I started in, in virology in 1959. So, but uh, there were a few more things to do, actually. <coughs> now, you could ask yourself, why didn't one wait for the, for the polio vaccine? Because According to uh, Nobel, it should for the benefit of mankind. And wouldn't it be nice to have that application in it? Well, so uh, Jonas Salk, the one who very rapidly developed the inactivated vaccine. And then a few years later, Sabin introduced his live vaccine. But that wasn't registered until the month, or and started for use in 1961, whereas the inactivated vaccine was available for use in 1955. Now, so there were many nominations for Sork, but Sven Gard and Sork had an argument. Sork said <coughs> that the inactivation of poliovirus is a first order kinetics, and one used formalin for that. Sven Gard said, it's not. It's much more complicated than that, because formalin can hit on both the genetic material of the virus and on its protein coat. And depending on that, you can have different kinetics. So what does uh, God say here? He says, according to my opinion, Salk has not demonstrated the caution that, that one would expect to be applied in this context. What had happened was that some of the early vaccines had led to polio in those that were vaccinated because the virus was not fully inactivated. And God did not accept that. He said, that is not the ethics we want to have. And it is my view, based on these conclusions, that Salk's publication on the polymerase vaccine cannot be considered priceworthy. That's a term that we use. It's not priceworthy. And if Sven Gard had said that, of course, Salk would never get the prize, and he never did. So this is the polio thing. But let me show the, what, what is developing right now in, in the field of, of polio vaccination. And here we talk about the use of the live vaccine. So the World Health Organization decided that they wanted to eradicate polio in, uh, in 1988. And they started a broad vaccination program. And you can see quite a success story. Originally, 125 countries had the disease ongo with ongoing infections, so-called endemic disease, and came all the way down to, to four here. Originally, one had hoped that this would come to an end in the year 2000. It did not. Turned out to be a number of complications. And we're still struggling with those complications. I won't dwell on that by simply showing, yes, we have three countries still that have endemic polio. It's, of course, Pakistan and Af 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 Afghanistan and Nigeria. And here there are problems with infrastructure, and, and uh, man is really putting a pressure on this because there are just the three countries remaining. If one could bring that to conclusion, one should eradicate polio. Still some optimists, I think that we could do it at the end of this year. Uh, one thing that's encouraging is that just in the last two years, the whole of India has become polio free. For a long time, India has remained with, with polio. So that's about eradication of this disease. In fact, polio virus type two has been eradicated. This one and three that we are struggling with right now. And the inspiration to eradicate polio, of course, came from the success of eradicating smallpox. And this is a fantastic story of organization. And I would like to point out one of my heroes here, Frank Fenner, a most fantastic colleague and uh, yeah, a very, very qualified 
uh, virologist and an uh, inspirator. And he uh, was the chairman of the committee that declared uh, that smallpox had been eradicated from the world, which is a fantastic achievement. You could ask, so why don't give a, a Nobel Prize for that achievement? That's indeed to the benefit of mankind, because there were millions and millions of people dying in, in, in smallpox. Now, it, so we have a rule at the Kalinske Institute and at the Academy too, we do not give <coughs> uh, prizes to institutions. We give it to individuals, maximum three individuals. And uh, in this case, it was, I mean, uh, the World Health Organization, it was that. So uh, my suggestion would be, why, don't, why couldn't one give a, a peace prize for such a contribution? Uh, it could be an interesting uh, way of, of, of solving this dilemma that we can't give it to institutions. Now, so one can even show this is the last case of smallpox uh, that happened in our world, and we don't need to vaccinate any longer. I won't go into the other aspect of that. But I'm very, very glad that Mr. Governor mentioned measles because that was my first lab in virology and that's what I wanted to bring this picture in here. And it is true that uh, in, the, in a quiet way, I mean, uh, the World Health Organization had decided we need to do something about measles because for many years there were one million children dying in measles from a readily preventable uh, uh, disease because they have a good vaccine. And the outcome of this is that from the year 2000 to 2010, there is a reduction to the, this number of 139,000 cases, 74% reduction. One had aimed actually for a 90% reduction, but didn't reach that. And there are a number of other uh, complications. But you can see in, in the Americas and in Europe, yes, it, 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 one has really come a long way. Now, if the World Health Organization had decided to eradicate measles instead of polio, I'm sure that one would have, would have brought, uh, concluded that by now because uh, it is e much easier to eradicate measles than to eradicate polio. But there are ambitions forward. The plans are now from the 2012 to 2015 to come down to the 90% level and in the year 2020, the goal is to have eradicated measles in five out of the six regions. So that's really a good hope for, for the future. There is another disease that has been eradicated that very few people know about. And that is uh, the disease rinderpest that occurs in cattle. And rinderpest is a very close relation to measles. In fact, it's probable that measles, uh, which is this acute disease in human, humans, came from, from, from rinderpest and adapted to human beings. Because these acute infections, they are community dependent. And human civilization didn't have large enough populations until about 3,000 years ago where one could sustain acute infection. I think most of you will be surprised to hear that more than 5,000 years ago, there were no common cold, there were no measles, mumps, rubella, what have you. They have all developed at a later stage because they're community dependent. Now, anyhow, so this gentleman here, Walter Plowright, some, some very pioneering work. And if one can now conclude that, and I think it's about 2008, that one declared the world free of rinderpest, so one. <coughs> The vaccine had really served its purpose and need not be used any longer. So that's about eradication of diseases. And let me come back to, to Burnett and then to the, the case of his polio, uh, his Nobel Prize. So Sven Gard was struggling with uh, the, <coughs> the nomination for, for Burnett because being a tall figure that he was, he was nominated from 1948 and onwards, over and over again. And Sven Gard were reviewing all this, and, and each time there was reviewed all this fantastic work, the emphasis on, on receptors, and then the, all these are contributions that are price worthy. And so he was declared price worthy. But the question is, what, which discovery should one select them? And, and, and I think Gard properly selected. The, this discovery that the influenza virus has receptors. If you block these receptors, you can block the disease. Makes a lot of sense. But that never came about. And year after year, and in 1957, 
when Burnett became an, 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 a foreign member of our academy, he said, okay, I guess that instead of the Nobel Prize. Then. So, and this is what happened in the Nobel work. It comes up uh, like this, and if it doesn't carry, then in the end, of course, the, 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 the interest is coming down. So here was a problem. Here was a person who really should have the Nobel Prize. And, uh, but one couldn't sort that out in, within his contributions in virology. So, so what happened? He uh, instead got a prize in immunology. And just by way of background, I wanted to illustrate to you this. Immunology has been, is very well represented among Nobel Prizes. And these were the pr five prizes in immunology prior to 1960. <clears throat> but there hadn't been anyone since 1930, so it was quite a, quite a long time span here. Now, the reason this came about is an, an example of how a committee tried to really resolve a very complicated issue. In 1958, there was a nomination for Medaware and his collaborators for uh, <clears throat> their demonstration that one could induce uh, tolerance. And uh, the story about that, to, to, to give you that in, 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 a, in a summarized way, M Peter Medaware is really on this little, I would say, in the same category like Burnett when it comes to mind and character. He's one of the giants in science, one of the fantastic, brilliant intellects. And he became interested in the, in, during the Second World War about the possibility of transplanting skin. And in those days, one really didn't have an idea, why can't you take skin from one person and put it to another person? And, and he reviewed that by, by found the basic techniques that there were uh, and uh, <coughs> could show that, yes, there's an inflammation process going on at a time of rejecting a tissue, that, that if you gave the same tissue twice, it would reject it faster the first time than the second, pointing towards that this is probably an immunological reaction. But no one really knew what, what the case was at that time. And so, uh, and also one could find that, yes, you could transplant skin within the individual from one part of the body to the other, but not between individuals, unless if they were identical twins. So, uh, uh, a man where was in Stockholm and he met a, a veterinary pathologist there who was a little intrigued by the fact that uh, he, he had problems in distinguishing identical and non-identical twins in calves. And uh, so we asked Medawar, what, what could I do about that? And of course, Medawar said a little, little cocky, oh, it's simple. I mean, you just take some tissue and you transplant that from one to the other. If it reject, rejected, they are non-identical. If it stays, they are identical. Oh, very simple. So they did the experiment and it failed. So why was that? Then they realized, and that was the first time that, that Medawar encountered that. That had been studied a few years earlier by and someone called uh, Owen, who had shown that there's something special about twins in cal calves, and they share their placenta. So therefore, this is a natural situation that even with, if you have uh, non-identical twins, there's an induction of tolerance, a mutual induction of tolerance. And Burnett, okay, so who was well read on this, and he had been reflecting on problems like that, self and non-self. How does the body distinguish between uh, that it doesn't react with the immune system to its own cells, but it reacts to foreign uh, infectious agents and other things. And Burnett's thinking is really very, very crystal clear. And he simply said the following, and it comes in a book together with Frank Fenner in 1949. And what does he say? He says, if in embryonic life, expandable cell from a genetically distinct race are implanted and established, no antibody response should be developed against the foreign cell antigen when the animal takes on an independent existence. You can notice it's brilliant language also. This sen two sentences is the basis for Burnett's Nobel Prize. That's no experiment, nothing. He tried to confirm it, he failed. But Meraware and, and his people, uh, they, uh, that is, together with Billingham and, and Brent, they did the experiments. 
So they used inbred mice, and they uh, simply took out cells from one strain of mice, injected that into the embryo at that very stage of development, and could show that uh, yes, tolerance was induced. And it was simple to, to illustrate because if you look at this mice, you could now take a skin from the black mice, the cells from which had been used to try to induce this tolerance, and it could grow and it, there was no immunological reaction. So very clean, simple experiment. And that was the basis for, for this Nobel Prize. Now, <coughs> the first nomination for a prize to, uh, to Medaware came in 1958. And was reviewed by, by a colleague of Sven Garda, actually a next door neighbor, also a professor of bacteriology, um, Mal 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 Malgren. And he reviewed this very carefully and said, no, this is worth it. This is the best since, since Ehrlich and, 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 and these early prizes in immunology. But we cannot give a prize to Medawar without recognizing that, in fact, Burnett had already postulated this in his book from 1949. So that rested. Two years later, again, nomination for induced tolerance. But in none of those nominations is there a nomination for joining uh, Medaware and Burnett. No, that is constructed by the committee. So there is a nomination for Medaware, of course, for his work. And Sven Gard uh, evaluates that and, and it makes very clear, yes, this is a fantastic achievement. And uh, then there is another nomination for Burnett for his, his contribution to immunology, but not for induced tolerance, but before, for this clonal selection theory, because he had published this book in 1959 that was really breaking up uh, immunology and opening up new, new, new vistas on that. And then there's a nomination by Josh Lederberg, which may interest you guys, because uh, he nominates, uh, yes, Medaware uh, for in induced tolerance, he uh, discusses Burnett, and he thinks that no Burnett should probably get it for the influenza work. That is a major contribution. And, uh, but he mentions also that well, he has made some contribution in immunology, but then he thinks about the clonal selection theory. So, so Burnett was never nominated for his uh, con theoretical contribution to, to induce tolerance. So anyhow, so Sven Gard and, and the, the committee, they try to focus on this, and therefore he came up with a joint nomination of the two. The committee was not unanimous this year. The majority, they wanted to have John Eccles, an Australian, together with uh, Magoon. That was the majority, including the chairman, Ulf von Euler, and there were five members of the committee that know which be given to Burnett and Medaware. And that, it, Sven was very proud, I managed in the meeting with the faculty of college to take the final decision to turn them around. So Eccles had to wait uh, for some time before he could get his prize. But an interesting, uh, really, background to all this. And here are the two uh, Nobel laureates. I mean, they, I tell you, it, it's, it's very, very encouraging to, to, to write about their life contributions and how they follow up on this. Of course, Burnett, and uh, he said, <coughs> well, so I got it in immunology, but for the second best thing I did in immunology, what was, what was the best thing? Well, the best thing was, of course, the clonal selection theory. I mean, it, this is uh, something that's so fundamental. And uh, so Nils Jerne had found that sometimes you find antibodies to antigens that have ne never seen the animal before, like phages and so forth. And uh, he developed that in the mid-1950s, but it was Burnett who really said, I think it works on the level of clones. And then, then the, again, the common nominator is there must be receptors here. So how does it work? It works by in the body. There is an amazing generation of an immune response to essentially any kind of antigen. And then when a when foreign antigen gets in, it had to select a particular clone that has the best fitness, and then the cells start to divide. And that's how you could generate 
a clonal response, and that's how nature works. Nature is very wasteful. I mean, if those, those antibodies that we produce using this fantastic repertoire represent probably less than a per mil or something like that. Most of it is just there that's a, to, to safeguard the system. So, and um, in 1984, Nis Jane got uh, his Nobel Prize as a part of a prize that I'll show in a moment. And uh, then Burnett sent him a telegram, of course, to say, I think that you and I should have, should have shared that, that prize, but we are both Nobel laureates, so what, what, does, it, what does it matter? I mean, I mean, Now, I will brief in my presentation quite extensively here and I'll just say, so immunology has been very well covered by prices. Uh, of course, what we call innate immunity or non-adaptive immunity as was recognized in 1908, but um, uh, again, first 100 years later by the price of Beutler and Hoffman. Immunology has to do with antibodies. I would argue has also been very, very well covered, and I don't want to recapitulate, but, but we have given price to the structure of antibodies, to sensitive assays, to some of the genetics for production of antibodies, to the hybridoma technology, and to the technique by which our body can generate antibodies to essentially any antigen that there exists. What about cell mediated immunity. The fact that there were different branches of, of uh, immunology started to emerge way back in the 1940s by, by Landsteiner. Uh, <coughs> and uh, it showed there were some, some forms of immunity that could not be transmitted by antibodies, had to be transmitted by cells, with cell mediated immunity. And uh, this I could elaborate on quite, quite extensively on, but I won't do that because of time. I would argue that in this list of prices here, which actually include the, 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 the dendritic cells in 2011, this list is incomplete. The fundamentals of distinguishing B and T cells, I think they were named by Ivan Roth eventually, but, but there were people that discovered that, that uh, thymus is not a vestigial organ. It's the organ that is responsible for developing uh, the maturation of, of T cells. And the, for the distinction of different kind of T cells, uh, also at fu fundamentals. And uh, in addition, James Gowan's work on, on circulation of, uh, of, of, uh, of cells through the lymphatic system, those are very, very fundamental. In an essay, Meadowell has written about analytic and synthetic discoveries. And then he lists examples of what are synthetic discoveries. Well, one is circulation of lymphocytes by Gowans. One is identical T cells, and he mentioned both Jacques Miller and Bob Good. And uh, 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 he also mentioned one uh, third uh, kind of, of uh, synthetic discovery uh, to, to exemplify his case. So I wanted to show this, this picture, the, the man who has, did discover the T cells in 1961 and who has written this review 50 years later on, on this discovery. Australian Nobel laureates. I think this country should be rather proud of it, a series of Nobel laureates. But this is, you see, I put a little more, more reddish color on some of them. McFarlane Burnett, simply, he, he stayed with his home country and he developed in a fantastic way the, the field here. Eccles came a few years later, we have in literature, and then Peter Doherty, together with uh, it, it it's very highly motivated price in the field of cell-mediated immunity, but kind of uh, should have been preceded by some, some other prices. And of course, uh, Warren and Marshall, also a beautiful pioneering work that there is. And I would like to finish with something that I call John Eccles' experience of uncooling champagne. And they simply, so in 1960, seven of the 12 members voted for Eccles together with the chairman. And that he should receive the prize together with Horace Magoon, but five voted for Bernetta Mellow, who got the prize, right? Uh, fortunately, in a way, 
it was good that Magoon was never uh, recognized because later on he didn't come to the measure. But next year, when I worked further on the Eccles candidacy, which was, of course was very strong, and uh, seven of the 12 members, again, they voted for Eccles, together now with Alan Hodgkin and Andrew Huxley, but five voted for George von Birkesi, who eventually selected by the faculty. So again, had to take the champagne out of the, of the fridge and uh, put it back next year. But next year was the DNA year. So, and, and, uh, and that's another long story that I won't dwell on, but uh, the prize was given to Crick, Watson, and Wilkins, and in 1963, Eccles finally did receive his prize. So. And with this kind of progress that we, we have here from year to year, you, you can imagine that I will be kept busy as long as I have health to do this because and then I can start to write about, uh, actually I have written about BKC already and, and, and I have some, five, some six chapters for a coming book and as I would add uh, the 1962 story, which of course is its own right. But then from there on, you can write on neurophysiology, a lot in molecular biology. 1960s is a very exciting time in the Nobel Prizes, very, very high quality prizes. And uh, yeah, this is all very, very a great learning experience. And I know that time is flying, so I would like to just express my thanks to you for this, uh, your, your patience. And uh, to you, uh, Derek, and I know I'm it's been a joy to honor you by this little presentation, and I look forward to all the coming contacts. Thank you so much. Well, Professor Norby, what a feast. Looking backwards at these great names, uh, it rings bells in the mind. I, I, I tried to tot up how many Nobel Prize winners I'd been taught by, and uh, I can count at least 10, and I won't go through the experience of all of them. But um, it really is a noble award, and long may it live. I'd like to just make one or two uh, thoughts that I might share with you. Um, we're going to have dinner uh, this evening in University House. And four years ago, I was having coffee in the afternoon in University House. And <clears throat> in walked a lady who I hadn't seen since I'd worked with her uh, in Nairobi in the 1970s. Professor Matai, the only woman from Africa to get a Nobel Prize, a Nobel Peace Prize. And I was so thrilled to see her. And I said, Professor Matai, do you remember the time that we were together in those veterinary laboratories that you referred to in your talk. And she said, yes, I do. And I said, um, tell me, I don't know about your Nobel Prize. Can you just explain it to me? And she said, yes, I was given the Nobel Peace Prize for succeeding in getting the women of rural Kenya to plant 40 million trees. Wow. Last year, Professor Matai died, but not before I'd given her a piece of paper, uh, which I'm going to give uh, to you <laughs> as well. Uh, I have a, um, a sin which is uh, collecting uh, antique books. And I brought this lovely book, which I've got a photocopy of, um, called A Treatise of the Laws of the Forest, uh, which was published uh, in England uh, and written by a man called John Manwood. 
and that was in 1615. But the book begins with the Carta de Forestia of King Canutus, a Dane, King of England, in 1016 AD, where he laid down the forest laws for England, and these were subsequently adopted by his other kingdoms of Denmark and Norway. But what an amazing document, and the governor would be fascinated by it with his legal background, because uh, it's now regarded as probably the original forest laws which determine where all Australia's forests belong. They are a property of the crown, thanks to King Canute. So King Canute's forest laws, 1016, um, give or take four years, that's a thousand years ago. Could you take this back with you? The pleasure. And see if you could think how we could celebrate the planting of all those trees and get it done not just in Kenya, but all over the world. Because this morning, looking at my emails, I see the uh, Director General of the World Wildlife Fund this very morning has announced that 13 million hectares of forest have been lost each year between 2000 and 2010. Canute told us how to save the world's forests. Surely we can do that again. Well, I would like to uh, give you a farewell present um, from the university that will celebrate your visit here and hopefully remind you of the happy times and the new faces that you've met. And I've been thrilled to meet you and to chat too often. But if I may just get the... Uh, difficult things to carry in your baggage, but um, uh, here is uh, a memorial to the Derek Denton lecture, um, which we would like to give to you, and the um, university um, crest on a lovely little medallion uh, inscribed to you. So I think we should give a loud round of applause you for that wonderful lecture and please come again. <laughs>